mentioned Brother Buster tonight. He is in Ohio, I believe, if I'm right, in Ohio. Uh, he had a uh, good pastor friend that passed away that wanted him to take part in the funeral. So he flew out this morning, and he's preaching up there in a church tonight. And then we'll be in that funeral, taking part in that funeral tomorrow and then flying home. So remember him as you pray, and I pray for the Lord to continue to bless in that. Uh, someone asked me earlier about the funeral service today and how things went. Uh, I always come away from, from uh, a, a day like today uh, feeling uh, uh, like I have not been able to do what I, I needed to do in, in a situation. Uh, as most of you know, uh, things are quite different with funeral services today than they've been, and there's so much restriction. and. Uh, when, when you go to National Cemetery to have a graveside service, all you have is a 30-minute window. That's 30 minutes from the time you've put your feet on the ground until the service has got to be over because they're basically are having uh, funerals uh, about every 30 minutes uh, there in National Cemetery. And uh, when you add into that uh, the folding of the flag, and those things are beautiful, and I wouldn't take away from that any, anything in the world. Uh, you know, because it is so, it is so meaningful and, and, and certainly needs to be done for somebody of the stature of, of Brother Richard uh, Van Eyes and, and his military service. But you, you've got about 10 minutes involved in that, and that leaves you a total of 20 minutes to do anything else. And uh, to, try to try to preach a sermon that you feel is, is, will justify the situation in that is, is almost incapable. And about, about all you can do is read some verses and make a couple of comments, and that's basically all I did today. Uh, what, a, what a great man, what a tremendous man uh, Brother Van Eyes was, and, and, uh, and certainly worthy of being honored. Uh, they are, the funeral home is going to print up some more of, of the, uh, they, they actually printed up something about like, uh, our, our prayer bulletin that size with uh, his uh, uh, information concerning his military service and, and, and uh, all, all of that, and, and they're going to bring somebody to Mars. So we'll have some of those Sunday for those of you who didn't go, get to go to the funeral. But I will tell you, Miss Pat said, please tell everybody that I have sensed their prayers. I feel their prayers. I know folks have been praying for us, and I, and I hope you'll continue to do that. And, I uh, trust the Lord to help her in the days ahead. We're in Psalms 119 on Wednesday evenings. If you have your Bible, and I trust you do, we're uh, down to uh, stanza 22, I believe, in uh, this 119th Psalm. 176 verses. Uh, the Word of God's mentioned in every verse. God's mentioned in every verse uh, except uh, three. Uh, if I don't have that, if I don't have that reversed. I, but anyway, uh, longest chapter in the Bible, but uh, it is unique in that the Word of God is emphasized all the way through. So many different emphases concerning the Word of God, and uh, that is uh, true again with the, uh, the verses. We're looking at verse 89 tonight, and we'll read down through verse 96. If you've got your Bible open, uh, you uh, follow along as I read at, at the wonderful verses that are here. Psalms 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine ordinances, for all, all are thy servants. Unless thy law had been my delights, I should then have perished in mine affliction. I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. We use two words out of uh, verse 89 as a, uh, a title or a theme for the message tonight, forever settled. Let's pray, and then we'll look at some thoughts here tonight. Father, thank you for our time together here on a Wednesday evening, and Lord, the privilege to stand and open your word, and Lord, try to share with your people some things that will 
uh, will strengthen their hearts, that will uh, establish them in, their, uh, in a greater way in their faith and, and give them strength, Lord, to walk with you, to trust you, and uh, Lord, uh, again, a greater appreciation for the Word of God, especially as we look at the verses of this 119th Psalm. Bless our time now. Father, you know uh, if there's one in this room tonight who has spiritual need, you know where that one is. And I pray you'd touch their heart. I pray you'd quicken their heart, make them aware, Lord, of that need tonight and, and help them to sense you're dealing with their heart and help them to respond. They need to be saved to get saved. They need to get right with the Lord, whatever it might be, Lord, to respond and let you have your way in their heart and life. We'll praise you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. Forever settled. 19, 1975, latter part of the year of 1975, in revival services in August, uh, the Lord dealt with my heart, called me to preach, uh, brought me to a place to finally stand before the church. God had been dealing with my heart for some time and uh, announced to the church that God had called me to preach. Uh, my intent in all of that was to uh, spend some time going to Bible school. I'd already worked things out for God. You know how you do that. You know, I was going to go to Tennessee Temple. They were having evening courses at that time and, and uh, take some Bible school courses. And then uh, after a period of time, uh, go on as the Lord opened the door and pastor. But uh, God moved uh, just in a tremendous way. Shortly after uh, I answered the call to preach, I wound up filling in for a pastor for about three months who had been severely injured in an automobile accident, preaching for him every Sunday morning and every Sunday night. And I got, uh, got my feet wet. Uh, I'd been teaching Sunday school for a long time, but it's a lot different when you're preaching Sunday morning and Sunday night. And I found out what it was like to have to study and prepare for two messages a week. And uh, in the midst of that time, the Lord opened the door for us to uh, move from uh, our home community uh, down in, uh, outside of Somerville in a little place called Subligna, Georgia. And I went to Griffin, south of Atlanta, about an hour, about an hour's ride south of Atlanta to pastor. And uh, I went green as a, as a gourd. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, I knew the basic doctrines of the Bible, but there were a lot of things that I, I needed some foundation work done on. And I faced some things quickly as I began to pastor that I had to really get into God's Word and get some help on. And one of those areas was concerned the Word of God. I grew up in a church. My pastor used a Schofield Bible. Uh, I had a Schofield Bible. That's all I'd ever used, King James Version. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, but it had, it, it had already started in 1976. It had become a little bit fashionable. Some of the Bible translations were coming. Living Bible had come out. Uh, there were a couple of others that, that were out. Good News for Modern Man, the Southern Baptist past, uh, had printed that. It wasn't good news uh, for modern man. It was bad news for any man. And uh, I began to have people question me about uh, Bible translations. And uh, I didn't have a, a good firm answer. And so I had to quickly get into words, God's word and uh, quickly do some research and some studying in my own heart and life to get myself settled on what I believe to be the word of God. I'm very thankful for that time in my life and, and how the Lord uh, allowed me to come in contact with some folks that helped me greatly and uh, got my feet uh, settled as far as what I believe to be the Word of God, and, and I, I say it without, uh, without any embarrassment tonight, without, without any hesitation at all. I believe what I'm reading out of tonight, what I'm holding in my hands, this, uh, this King James Bible, and I know it's not the 1611 version. Okay, I know all that. I've been confronted with about everything you can be confronted with, uh, but, but I do know without a doubt in my heart, having examined the text and looked at, at, at so many different things, what I have in my hand tonight is God's preserved word for the English-speaking world. Now, if you go to Mexico, you're going to have to get a Mexican translation. If you go to Russia, you're going to get a Russia translation. I mean, I understand all those things, but for, for me and, and where I am and where we are, Looking at all that, that has taken place, I, I, I'm convinced in my heart that what I'm reading out of it tonight is the Word of God. If I didn't know that, I'd be in search for what was, and I, I, I would quickly tell you that. But I believe this is uh, God's Word, and it is forever settled. Those two words, as you read them here in verse number one, speak of confidence. The confidence in the life of uh, the psalmist uh, speaks of security. 
Uh, you, you're not listening to somebody who's not secure in their faith. He's very secure uh, in, in his faith here. God is clearly telling us here that we can count on the word of God, that it is forever settled. What a desperate need there is in our world today for something that uh, you can know for sure, something that is settled. Uh, we, we live in a time when young people are looking for something that, uh, that, that is for certain, something that is settled, something they can depend on uh, in their lives. In fact, people all around the world are looking for the peace and the joy and, and the meaning to life that to only God can give through his eternal forever and settled word of God that we're looking into here this evening. Whether it's young people, whether it's old people, we're all alike. We're looking for something that we can count on. You, from now, you feel like I am uh, now and then I've had people say to me, you can count on me. Well, if there's any one thing I have learned in life, you can't count on people. Uh, we, we need something that we can count on. Uh, you, you can't count on politics and politicians. That, I mean, that's a settled fact. Thank God we can count on the Word of God. It is forever settled. Thank the Lord for that tonight. The, this 12th stanza of Psalms 119 tells us that the Word of God is settled forever. And in these verses, uh, the psalmist points out four uh, very important qualities of God's Word. And I want us to just quickly look at those tonight. You might want to write these uh, words down beside the verses that are here and uh, help you as you come back and look at these uh, at a later time. In verses 89, 90, and 91, he talks about the permanence of God's Word. He begins in, in uh, verse 89 by telling us why the Word of God is important. He says, Forever, O Lord, thy Word. God's word is permanent because it's his word. It is the Lord's word. He's eternal and his word is eternal. That, that's why God doesn't need to change his mind. Uh, he knows everything. He's omniscient. He knows everything in the past. He knows everything that's going on right now, whether it's great or small, and he knows everything in the, in the future. If it were possible for something to happen that God did not know about, if anything ever slips up on God that he doesn't know about, immediately he will cease to be God. But, but that's never going to happen. Acts chapter 15 and verse 18 says, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of, of the world. I, I, I wouldn't stand up here and complain about my memory tonight. It's, uh, it's serving me the best it can. But I can't depend on my memory. Have you found that to be true in your life? H have you found yourself in conversation with somebody and you get ready to tell them something and all of a sudden, pfft, there it went, you know? Uh, I, I, I love Miss Carol. She, she's such a sweet lady and, and she'll be telling me something and, and, and she'll say, hmm, when I get ready for you to know that, I'll come back and tell you. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm beginning to use that a lot. I can't depend on my memory anymore. But I want to tell you, God's memory is perfect. Amen? God, God doesn't ever forget. He doesn't forget when he comes to this world. He, he, he never forgets about all that's gone on in the past. God knows about what's going on right now. Uh, he, he's aware of, 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 of when it all began. He, he's aware of what's happening. In fact, God already knows what's going to happen in the end of this thing. God already knows where all this thing is headed to. So we see, first of all, the why of the permanence of God's Word. It is His Word. Uh, he's eternal and His Word is eternal. Secondly, he emphasizes here where it's permanent. Look, look at the last part of verse 89. Thy Word is settled in heaven. First of all, it's settled in heaven. Thank God. Aren't you thankful tonight that the Word of God is beyond the reach of men? Men are arguing in this world about what, what is truth and what is not, tr not truth. They're, they're those who use some uh, real religious terms today and they will say about the Bible, well, the Bible contains uh, God's, uh, uh, the, the meaning of what God wants to say, but, but everything that's there is not the Word of God. Well, I'm going to tell you, every jot and every tittle of this book uh, is there because God wanted it to be there and it's, it is God's Word. 
Men through the centuries have uh, done everything they could to, to change the Word of God with no success. You've heard the name Voltaire before. Voltaire was a wicked atheist man who, who uh, made the, the, the brash statement that, uh, that he'd put an end to the Word of God, that, that, uh, that there'd be a time after he got through that there would be no Word of God. People wouldn't have confidence in the Word of God. Well, Voltaire's dead. I mean, he's long since been gone. And did you know that uh, the very house and, and office that he worked out of, a short time after he died, they, they turned into a Bible society place and Bibles were printed and sent out that place? Why? Because God's Word is settled in heaven tonight. It is this, listen, when we get to heaven, the Word of God's going to be there. It's eternal. It's settled in heaven, far beyond the reach of all of its enemies in this world. But the psalmist tells us something else. Look, look at verse 90. He says, thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth and it abideth. Not only is the word settled in heaven, but it's settled on earth. <laughs> it's a settled fact on earth. Here in this verse, he takes us back to the first page of the Bible. And he points out that, that God established the earth. The world we live in demonstrates the permanence of the word of God. All around you, all through this day, even today, Everything that you looked at in this world demonstrated the permanence of God's, uh, God's Word. And it's, ex it's expressed throughout the world. Think about this. On the first day, according to Genesis chapter 1, the Bible tells us God created light. And uh, He set in motion the law of light in this world. On the first day, and he ordained on that day that light would travel at 186,000 miles per second. Hadn't changed a bit. It's, it's traveling at the same speed tonight. The, the purpose of light when he created it was to dispel darkness. And, and it still dispels darkness. The sun comes up, darkness has to flee. The sun goes down and darkness comes back in. That's never changed. That's the word of God. On the second day of creation, God separated the waters and the waters and set in motion the forces of evaporation and condensation by, by which the earth is renewed and, and replenished. And I want to tell you that continues today. It never changes. The same thing happened today that's happened every day since God spoke this world into being. Uh, water condensated, went up into the clouds. The clouds blew somewhere where rain needed to fall, and the rain came down. The rain came down, ran into branches and the creeks and the rivers and ran back into the sea, and the sun pulled it up again. And I'll tell you, that's been going on ever since God set all that in motion. On the third day of creation, God separated the oceans from the continents. And he ordained the depths and the bounds of the sea. And things haven't changed. They haven't changed at all. On the fourth day of creation, God put in service the sun to rule by day and the moon by night. And by that, he ensured the regular round of the seasons. God set all that in motion and it continues. And then along with that, that, that sun has been used by man through the centuries as a timepiece to, to, to uh, guide us by, by the hour of the day. On the fifth day of creation, God established the fish and the fowl. Uh, and he said, in order the laws of their being. And they have continued. On the sixth day of creation, God created all forms of animal life. And he crowned man to be ruler over all that he'd created. And that still is in place tonight. Just as God spoke it into being, just as he created it by the word of, it, of his mouth, it continues to be today. By the way, don't get your heart and mind all upset by this crowd of tree huggers and this crowd that's all worried about global warming. And all those other things that they're, oh, well, you know, this crowd's got to say, we got to do something. We got to do it quick. If we don't, the world will be gone in 10 years. What a ridiculous thought. Listen to me. If the world ends in 10 years because of, of what man is doing, and that, that doesn't remove our need to be good stewards of what God has put in our hands at all, we ought to, we ought to do our best to keep our environment clean. We ought to work at all those things. But I want to tell you tonight, God put it all in motion and it's continued to this day and it will to the day God says it's over and it's done. 
What's all that tell me tonight? That tells me that I can count on the word of God. God's word is settled in heaven. It's settled on earth. And that ought to be a settling thing to our souls tonight. Why? Because its permanence gives us something solid to rest our faith on. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Baptist by conviction tonight. I wasn't saved in a Baptist church, but I became a Baptist because I studied the Word, and I believe the Baptist church is the closest thing to a New Testament church in this world today. But I want to tell you tonight, I'm not going to heaven resting my faith on, on, on Baptist dogma. I can tell you that. Listen, I'm walking my way to heaven tonight with my feet, my feet set, it, set down on the foundation of the Word of God. So the psalmist tells us why the Word of God is permanent. Where the word of God is, is permanent. But then he also tells us in verse 91, when the word of God is permanent. Look at it. They continue this day according to thine ordinances for all are thy servants. They continue this day. What he's saying is this. They were established and they abide. Isaiah 40 and verse 8 says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Matthew 24 and verse 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 25, But the word of the Lord endureth forever. Thank God tonight, His word is permanent. It is, it is, it is an everlasting word tonight. Everything, everything that God created in this world are his servants. And they behave like God told them to behave. Everything, everything, everything that's in this world, God spoke into being and, and created them to be his servants. And they're doing exactly what he tells them to do. This entire universe is a vivid demonstration of the faithfulness of God's word. God's faithfulness to all generations as changeless as his word. What a source of comfort. That ought to be to my heart and to your heart tonight, the permanence of God's word. But notice secondly here, not only does he emphasize the permanence of God's word, but the protection of God's word. Look at verse 92. Unless thy law had been my delights, I should then have perished in mine affliction. Notice uh, the psalmist's delight here in God's word. He said, unless thy law had been my delights. Go back and take a little time to read Psalms chapter 1 that talks about the blessed man. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in what? The law of the Lord. What the psalmist is telling us here is that the, the word of God is no stranger to him. Let me tell you, here's where, here's where we often get in trouble in our lives. We don't pay attention to God's word. In fact, we're guilty of ignoring the word. We'll come to church and open our Bibles and the preacher will read the, uh, the, the text and he'll preach the message and we close our Bibles and, and we never pay heed to what we, we've heard, what the Lord has brought to our minds. Or we pick up our Bibles in the morning and we read them in our devotional time. We close them and that's the last time we think about what God is saying to us out of his word. And then we begin to run into problems. And problems will always come when you're not, when you're not delighting yourself in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the law of the Lord. The reason so many Christians come apart on the rocks of trouble in this world is that they have not delighted their hearts in the word of God. The psalmist talks about his delight in God's word, but he also talks about his deliverance because of God's word. Do, do, do you see here in, in verse 92, he says, I will never forget thy precept, for with them thou hast quickened me. Uh, what, do you, what do you say? No, excuse me, I read the wrong verse. Uh, you know what I didn't, I read the right verse. You see what he's saying here? No matter what came in my life, I found the strength I needed to face that time. Where? In the word of God. I've had people say to me, I don't understand how so-and-so is going through this time of grief and sorrow in their life. And uh, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm totally wrong about this, and, and, and I apologize if I am. 
But, but it seems as though we live in a world today where people, at a time of death in somebody's life, people want to see people just absolutely, totally come unglued and, and go into, a, uh, a, a, into a, 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 a spasm, if you will, uh, over the death of a loved one. Well, now, God never intended for us to react that way in the death of a loved one. Uh, uh, listen, if you're delighting in the law of the Lord, you're spending time in the word of God. When a loved one dies, sure, there's going to be sorrow and rightfully so. I don't mean there ought not be tears, but, but I'm talking about this demonstration of hopelessness in somebody's life. One of the first, uh, one of the first funerals I had as a young preacher, I had a dear old saint of God in the church when I went to Griffin and, and she was a precious lady and she, uh, she had some problems with diabetes and wound up having to have a leg cut off. And, and uh, she still came on to church. I want to tell you, she still came on to church. I was just always amazed at that. But they called me one morning about 10 o'clock. She had died. And uh, 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 they, they thought she had died. And they were on the way to the, to the emergency room there at the hospital in Griffin. And I jumped in the car and got down there. When I, uh, God, here's what I'm saying. When I, got out of, when I got out of my little old car there in the parking lot, her daughter, who was a member of the church and, and a Sunday school teacher, came out the back doors of that emergency room screaming like, a, like a, 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 a banshee was after her, waving her arm. God is dead! God is dead! God is dead! I felt Holy Ghost compunction to walk right up in her face. And I said, Granny's dead? Yes! I said, where is she at? She said she's in heaven. I said, then why don't you start acting like she's in heaven? And I took Barbara to the side and I said, now, Barbara, this, this is no way to react in the midst of this. I, I, you said, preacher, that's unkind. No, it's not unkind. A Christian ought not to act that way. Sure, there's grief and sorrow there. Sure, sure, there's an emptiness there. I know we're all different emotionally, but I want to tell you, the Word of God will give you confidence in the face of all of that. There's nowhere else to go outside of God's Word. Thank, thank God for the protection that's ours in the Word of God to give us help in our times of need. So the psalmist has directed our thoughts here to the permanence and the protection of God's Word. Then in verses 93, 94, 95, he talks about the power of God's Word. He said, I'll never forget thy precept, for with them thou hast quickened me. I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. He's talking about God, the power of God's word. And he emphasizes three areas in our lives that God's work, word will work. First of all, the power of God's word to revive. He talks about that in verse 93. I'll never forget thy, test, thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened. Notice that word quicken. That, that word means to make alive. God's word has, has brought new life into him. The psalmist ha had committed God's word to memory. And now in times of temptation and trial, the Holy Spirit is using that word to quicken him or to revive him. How precious God's word is. Oh, how precious. What a, what a treasure this book is, God's word. When time of doubt comes, we can read 2 Timothy 2 and verse 12. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which, he, which I have committed unto him against that day. When the time of testing come in our lives and, and uh, temptation, we can read 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Then in those times when our commitment to church grows cold, we've all been there. We, we've all been in that place. We can read Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And then in those times when we get ill with one another, the Bible will confront, confront us and remind us that we're to love one another, that we're to bear one another's burdens. The Word of God planted in our hearts is there to quicken us, to revive us. Listen, the, 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 the reason we're in the mess we're in today in so many of our lives is because of our neglect of this precious book, God's Word. 
The psalmist emphasizes the power of God's word to revive. Secondly, he emphasizes the power of God's word to restore. Verse 94, I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. Now it's evident this is a saved man. He says, I'm thine. I belong to you, Lord. And, and, and the words save me express his desire to be brought back into a place of full fellowship. Save me. Lord, bring me back to where I need to be. He, he's crying out, that, Lord, I, I, I've, I've fallen out of the boat. Would you pull me back in the boat? But I want you to notice how simple his prayer is here. Save me. I mean, he doesn't make a speech to God. He, he's not trying to impress God with his, uh, uh, his uh, vernacular, his, his language. Save me. Uh, he's in need. And, and, and when a person's in need, they strip away all of that. And that's where the Lord wants us to come to in our own prayer lives. Notice he says, I have sought thy precepts. He may have stumbled. He may have made a mistake, but his motive was right. And his desire is to please the Lord. So often our trouble is that we want God to do something in our lives so that we can go on with our selfishness. We can go on with our carnality, our worldliness, living, uh, consuming our lives with materialism. The desire of the psalmist here is for the Lord to restore him. The power of God's word to revive. The power of God's word to restore. But then uh, notice in verse 95, he talks about the power of God's uh, word to, to restrain the wicked. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me. But I will consider thy testimonies. A couple of things that stand out to me in that verse. First of all, there's the persistence of the wicked. I'm always amazed at how persistent the wicked are. They never give up. I want to tell you, they put us to shame as God's people when it comes to the matter of persistence. I, 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 I mean, and, and, and you're going to say he's political again. But, but I, I want to tell you, this crowd of wicked Democrats put God's people to shame in this election. They've been persistent for the last four years, and certainly Donald Trump was no saint of God. I, I quickly say that tonight. But I want to tell you, they were persistent, what they're, and they're still persistent today. I can tell you, there's nothing more irritating to the wicked than the righteousness of God's people. There, there's not, listen, there, there's no greater aim in this world of the wicked than to shut the mouth of God's people, to take away their preaching, their teaching, their witnessing, the, the Word of God. This evil world cannot stand a godly person. And the wicked will never give up trying to, 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 to break that person down. They'll, they'll tempt him with immorality. They, they, they will hammer him with verbal compromise, with, with material great gain, you name it. They'll do all they can to get you to compromise and throw in the towel. You'll see an example of that. Look at the Lord Jesus Christ. They pursued him and taunted him not only until he was nailed to the cross, but they continued all that until the last drop of blood was gone out of his body and he cried, it's finished. Look at verse 95 again. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. On one hand, you've got the persistence of the wicked, but on the other hand, you've got the patience of the saints. He says, but I will consider thy testimonies. As God's people, we don't need to give up. We need to continue to look to the Lord. We need to stand on his word. We need to allow the, the, that word to safeguard our lives. You see, the only defense we've got in this world is the word of God. And the only way to restrain evil in, in our lives is to plant the word of God deep in our hearts. The psalmist said, uh, forever. O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. He talks about its permanence, its protection, its power. And then uh, in verse 96, he talks about its perfection. He said, I've seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. The word broad in that verse is an interesting word. It, it means large. It means roomy. It, it means wide. I talk to people and... and uh, uh, I'm thinking of someone right now that uh, I've talked to about uh, God and his word and, and uh, their, their concept of the word of God is too narrow. It's too restrictive. 
Well, that's not what this verse says. He says, thy commandment is exceeding broad. There's nothing larger or roomier or wider than the word of God. When you look at the philosophies of, uh, of men, you, you find that they're finite. They're limited. They're, they're inadequate. They're harmful because they're tainted by sin. Sin always clouds the issues. Sin, sin always darkens the intellect. Sin always narrows the, the vision. Sin always inflates the ego. Sin, sin will always corrupt our, our opinions and, and, and cause us to speak corruptly. Human intellect is always like that. But I want to tell you, the Bible is not. The philosophies and the theories of men are, are narrow because they leave out one great portion of life. And that's the eternal, the unseen. That there is a life beyond, an eternal life beyond this mortal life. And only the Bible gives us insight into that. You can't, you can't go anywhere else and learn the uncorrupted truth about God. I, I don't know how many books I have. I, I, I couldn't tell you. I've got some in, already in boxes that I put up. Uh, somebody said, how many books you've got? I don't know how many books I have. But I want to tell you, there's not one of them that I can turn to to give me what this will give me. Not one of them. And I, I, love, I love some of the men I study after and, and have studied after for years. I love and appreciate. But they can never give me what the Word of God gives to me. You see, the only Bible, only God's word gives us a hope for comfort when we stand at the grave of a loved one. Nobody, you can't get that comfort anywhere else. Only the Bible gives us a strength for living and the grace for dying and the hope of eternity. It tells us of life everlasting, life beyond, literally beyond our imagination tonight. That's what the psalmist is saying here. Thy commandment is exceeding broad. The word of God forever settled. No matter how fierce the storms of life, no matter how much our lives may be tossed by the winds and the waves of adversity, you can rest assured this evening that the Bible, God's holy word can be trusted in every detail, not just now, but always, whenever, whenever and wherever and whatever you're faced with, you can always trust the Word of God. No wonder, after the psalmist wrote this stanza, he begins that next stanza. Look at verse 97, and he says, Oh, how love I thy law. Man, I mean, if you, if you, if you know this about God's Word, then you're a place to express that love for the Lord. E.L. Langston, author and, and Bible teacher, in one of, one of his books says this about God's Word. He says, there's a strange plant in Jamaica called the life plant. It is called this because it's almost impossible to kill or destroy any portion of it. When a leaf is cut off and hung by a string... Instead of shriveling up and dying like any other leaf, it sends out white thread-like roots. And through those roots, it gathers moisture from the air and begins to grow new leaves. And he went on to say the Bible is the life plant of the moral and spiritual world. Circulate the Bible or portions of it anywhere and it'll soon take root in the affections and heart of mankind and send out tendrils of life. In the heart of Africa, among the Aborigines of South America, among the Eskimos of the Arctic Circle, wherever it has the same quickening power, which no climate or heathenism has the power to kill. Forever settled in heaven. The Word of God. Thank God for His Word tonight. I would not have one reason on earth to come and stand in this pulpit on Sunday night and su uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night and Wednesday night and open this book. Did I not know that it was forever settled in heaven? Aren't you thankful for the word of God tonight? I'm going to ask you to bow your head with me and we're going to have a word of prayer and Miss Janet's going to come and play a verse of an invitation song in just a moment. But here's what I want you to do tonight. 
Maybe it's been a while since you said to the Lord, I, I just want to thank you for your word. Oh, Lord, I want to thank you for your word. It was that word that quickened my heart and made me to know I was lost and I needed to be saved. And it was through that word that I was birthed into the family of God, born again by the incorruptible word of God. Thank you, Lord, for your word today that helped me face the str struggles that I face. And thank you, Lord, for the, uh, the valleys that you've taken me through with this book, the word of God. Why don't you just thank him for that tonight? And then if you're here and you need to come and ask the Lord for help spiritually in your life, I'm going to ask you to step out and come, find a place here, and we'll pray with you, help you in that area. Father, thank you for your word and the time that we've had together, and Lord, for the truth that's here. Now bless in this invitation time, and again, Lord, help us to be responsive to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you stand with us just a moment, heads bowed and eyes closed. Just another moment while you're praying.